members and the moderator, and then we can start this discussion, right? Uh, so here we have Amitabh. So Mr. Amitabh is the co-founder and CEO of Altigree and Propulsion Labs. Uh, it's one of the largest three-wheeler cargo vehicle manufacturer in companies in India, and it has received awards from several uh, reputed organizations and has raised 48.8 million in funding from Reliance Six Sense Ventures and many other VCs. And uh, we have Kartikeya. Kartikeya is the founder and CEO of uh, Charge Zone and Billini. So uh, Charge Zone, Charge Zone is one of the country's fastest-growing uh, EV charging networks. Uh, so it's building high-speed public infrastructure, in public charging infrastructure, and has raised uh, 54 million in its uh, Series A. Uh, next we have uh, Rajinder. So uh, Rajinder is the MD of uh, Matrix Partners India. So uh, I'm sure most of us know Matrix here. Matrix has uh, over 100 investments with uh, 1.5 billion dollars uh, AUM. So Rajinder handles a portfolio of uh, consumer B2B and fintech companies at uh, Matrix Partners. So some of these include Ola, Park Plus, Dukan Auto, and many more. Uh, next we have Chaitanya. So Chaitanya is the Associate Director of E-Mobility at WRI India. So she's led various research and project uh, uh, on uh, electric mobility initiatives at the national and state levels. So she oversees uh, government EV partnerships in six Indian states and has co-authored a uh, Niti Aayog book on uh, charging infrastructure implementation. And uh, we have our moderator, uh, Mr. Manu Ayer. He's the founder and managing partner of Blue Hill Capital. So Blue Hill Capital is an early stage fund uh, backing innovative ideas in deep tech, IoT, industrial and the clean tech space. So it has a portfolio of about 20 companies and uh, they invest in the ranges of 100 to 500k for each company. Uh, so please give a warm welcome to the panelists and the moderator. Uh, we can begin the session now. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, how is everyone today? Morning. Good to see, you know, so many people out on a Saturday morning here. Uh, so the title says the role of government, you know, in accelerating EV adoption. I think there's a lot to unpack there, you know, as innocuous as that title looks. I think there's a lot to unpack and I think we have the uh, perfect mix of people to have this conversation with. Uh, so let's kick things off uh, uh, with Amitabh. So, you know, government regulation, I think the most talked about and I think the most infamous policy, you know, is fame, right? Uh, the faster adoption. Uh, so it expires in March 24. I think there is a uh, lot of nuances around it. And so I will ask you to address that policy as it concerns you specifically in the three-wheeler segment. And then uh, Kartike can also chime in on that. Sure. So uh, fame is the faster, um, um, you know, the adoption and manufacturing of hybrid and electric vehicles. Uh, it was as a, as a policy, it was started... Um, you know, in 2010 or something, and then they barely did anything in the first phase. The second phase uh, was started in 2019, expires in uh, 2024, 31st March 2024. Um, so a couple of things that, um, you know, I am a little challenged about is, uh, first of all, we had earmarked 10,000 crores, we spent about 3,000 crores, and we're still unsure if we will consider this policy or extend this policy at all. Um, everyone says that it will get extended, but uh, there's no announcement for it. Um, I have a challenge there. I don't think there is ever a precedent in any other country where three years, four years, five years of subsidies have really made a difference. Uh, that's number one. Number two, my bigger challenge is when I talk to uh, you know the government, a lot of them talk about fame being extended uh, in different shapes and forms. Uh, but there's no announcement yet. When FAME is announced, an extension or a FAME 3 policy is announced, everything related to EVs will need to be recertified for FAME. For FAME 3. Recertified. Everything. Not just vehicles, battery packs, everything. And it takes months to do that. We're already sitting in December. 31st March, things expire. Every vehicle 
ever to be sold in this country or being sold in this country or being manufactured in this country has to go through that process if it's need if it needs any kind of subsidy again there'll be queues the same thing that happened for battery packs last year is probably going to get replicated this year i think it's high time that they were cognizant of these things and whichever way it is um, yes or no but um, i think better to announce it so that you know manufacturers oems like us we can at least uh, you know start making those decisions we can start working with the financing side so if subsidy is not there what do you do um, how do you make sure that people still accept it because they like vehicles it's not because of the price but they like vehicles and so so there's a lot that can be done uh, without the subsidy and i'm not saying it should continue indefinitely can be tapered down the ways in which it can happen but it's important to set those stakes in the ground and say this is it guys this is how it's going to be going forward whether there's going to be a mix a new one an extension whatever it is i think the announcement is all i'm waiting for just to make sure that it's happening awesome so uh, kartik you know as it pertains to you right and your charging network and fast charging network can you talk about how the fame itself would uh, you know what are the issues that you would see with that i think it's a little deja vu feeling because uh, uh, when we started charge zone in early 2019 and uh, there were general elections and fame to was released just before general elections and we were one of the one of the industry representatives uh, being consulted for the charging infra kind of thing. now honestly uh, the word subsidy is very <laughs> very dangerous uh, we know what has happened uh, to the agriculture sector in the country over the last 50 years i think viability gap funding is a better term to use but when uh, we as ev charging company um, were in discussions uh, we were told that uh, there uh, there are various uh, strings around the charging in you got to install a two wheeler charger three wheeler all type of charges and uh, we honestly walked out uh, we said that we don't need a subsidy because uh, because um, in business nobody likes uncertainties as amitab said i think i can see him i can just imagine rather he and his team going through a pain of what business plan will we make now for the next 3 years when there are uncertainties around fame to uh, the certification fame so um for for us we took a bold call on uh, focusing on high speed charging infrastructure for four years our business model is that we invest we build a charging infra and we sell electrons and molecules that's it so we are the gas station of the future right. and um, and having said that we are also a firm believer that there needs to be uh this vgf or viability viability gap funding as an option given to the industry across the board uh two wheeler three wheeler have been the max to benefit but uh, private electric buses or the future electric trucks can also be part of, part of this scheme so a uh, very clear um i mean uh, let's say a, a clarity from the relevant government stakeholders will will will, will certainly help and uh, vgf uh, maybe for the next uh, two years or three years until we see Uh, uh the cost of production of this vehicles especially batteries they come to a reasonable uh, bankable levels i think that's where the vgf can be can be tapered down but at the end of the day i will my my, my personally what i i would rather say and share is please remove uncertainties right either you give it you don't give it or whatever it is be certain of what 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 we want to do and that's the message to the law super uh rajinder i'm going to skip you for one second and then i'll come back uh so chaitanya So there, I mean, there are a host of policies, guidelines. You know, there is obviously fame. There's the E Amrit portal. You know, Atmanirbhar, PLI. Um, what needs to be done? You know, on a more holistic basis to improve the idea of localization in this ecosystem, right? To build self-sufficiency. How do you think through that as a policy think tank? Thank you. Thanks, Manu, for the question. Um, I think. Uh, I'll start off where Amitabh and Kartikeya left off, which is that the way we lay out policy roadmaps in our country is not necessarily long-term enough. Um, policy roadmaps are actually good when they do come out; they are good, and there is a decent amount of support that's given. So, fame totally is now, I think, just over ten thousand crores was allocated. um how well it was planned for disbursement how the enforcing and supporting mechanisms came up to ensure that it is used up could still be improved 
on the supply side as well i think 18000 crores for the advanced chemistry cell pli another 26000 crore for the auto pli advanced auto pli so there are investments public investments that are being announced to catalyze and accelerate the ecosystem but is this being announced in advance enough is this de-risking the ecosystem from a signaling point of view is i think where the weakness is so if industry needs to invest today for a certain amount of projected targeted demand tomorrow they need to have that clarity today for 2030 we've been talking about 2030 since 2015 we're getting closer to 2030 and yet a lot of the policy um, support that will be present in 2030 is still not clear today and one area where that becomes paramount where our clean energy transition itself sort of comes to be at stake is maybe in this whole uh, critical mineral supply chain um just maybe a week ago i think the government of india one of the headline items has been that the government of india has auctioned out uh, 20 blocks of critical minerals for mining um a mining timeline is 10 to 15 years like is 15 years from the time a mine is discovered potential deposits are discovered it will take 16 years for a mine to become operational now our critic uh, and and why are critical minerals important they sort of underpin the whole clean energy transition so uh, uh, an electric car for example actually uses six times the critical minerals that a regular car uses so as we are moving away from fossil fuels or hydrocarbon based energy we are moving towards mineral and rare earth supported energy mostly where they are required in our battery systems in our motors and various parts uh, both for renewable energy and electric mobility so with this uh, while uh, so so i wanted to touch upon this because this really illustrates the role of government policy and uh, the fact that if we have timelines like these 15 20 years we really needed to have started a while ago like maybe in 2018 2019 we started with uh, the khanij bidesh uh, india limited kabil was a tra- sort of institution that was set up under the ministry of mines to source strategic uh, investments in other countries we haven't made a lot of progress in that while we know that china controls a large part of the um, Uh, production and processing supply chain for critical minerals india is still very very nascent in that on that front so the kind of signals that need to go out so that investors actually invest today uh, for the future will need to be done so that you don't have critical minerals be a bottleneck in the future uh, where where the demand is there but the supply is not there because you don't have that supply chain in place supply chain shocks can lead to sort of the rise in prices we saw how lithium ion bi- battery prices went up again in the middle and are now tapering off again so and and with india a large part of our clean energy transition has been the uh, energy security aspect and we don't necessarily want to move from one sort of energy dependence to another sort of energy import dep- dependence so the role of government policy is really to lay out that clear road map and to start de-risking the ecosystem be it from a material substitution point of view to find more localized indigenous materials be it from a recycling point of view to ensure that some of that supply can be catered to by recycling and uh, reusing the minerals that are already in the batteries there today and to actually have that stability of the supply chain through mining investments in country as well as strategic uh, partnerships with other countries so that needs to happen and uh, i think that's where it becomes very clear awesome so i think uh, clarity i think is required in in policy i mean as obvious as that sounds uh rajender uh so i don't know if uh, i mean the audience knows so uh, Matrix uh, and Rajinder were invest- the first investors in Ola Electric, so I think they have a perspective. Uh, I think that very few do, and you have Park Plus, you have O2 on the financing side as well. Uh, so, could you, I think, briefly talk about Matrix Matrix's thesis in uh, EV? First of all? Sure. So, first of all, thank you, and to the entrepreneurs in the room, I think building in this sector is incredibly challenging, and so kudos to everyone who's working in this space. the 
First and foremost thesis when we backed uh, Ola Electric was honestly the founder. It was a special relationship. We had known the founder through his previous company. Uh, there were clear insights from Ola and EV and ride sharing from the multiple pilots that they had done. So it was frankly a very easy investment for us to make. But in terms of choices, I think the US EV ecosystem developed very differently from the China EV ecosystem. US, if you look at it, there are a few companies. Most of them are full stack. They kind of built vertically. They own battery, they own vendor ecosystem, they own components. And in a few cases, of course, they work with external partners. In China, it's developed as a much broader EV ecosystem. Where you have multiple different players in each part of the value chain. And there are enough competitors. And Tarun was bringing out this point that you know, just in motors, for example, there might be 450 companies, right? Whereas in India, there might be only a few. So I think when we were making the investment, the first question we asked ourselves was, which way will India likely go? Will it be more like the US in terms of vertical integration? Or will it be more like China? And one choice was really around, you know, how will government policy play out in this space? And it seemed to us that the only certainty in terms of government policy is that subsidies will end. Uh, we don't know when or viability gap funding will end. We don't know when. And so whatever business gets built, uh, we'll have to plan for that end and basically be a cost leader as well as an innovation leader from the get-go. And if you have to be a cost leader from the get-go, then you have to build at scale. Uh, and so obviously, again, the entrepreneurs that you back are slightly different. They think of the business from day one at scale. And Bhavish is absolutely one of those. Uh, so two-wheeler, largest market, 20 plus million units. Two-wheeler, largest factory in the world from day one. That was always part of the plan. Vertical integration, cell manufacturing, in-house, R&D, in-house from the get-go. Uh, and then if I go to the other pieces of the bomb, and how much of that is planned to be insourced and how much of it has already happened that I'm sure he wouldn't want us to disclose. But uh, most of it on day one was very clear in his mind. And we are privileged to be in partnership with such founders. Uh, I think it's challenging to build in this industry. I agree with Tarun and you know others that I suspect India will have somewhere in the middle, neither the US nor China. But if we end up thinking that it will be like China where there will be hundreds of companies that succeed, I think we're pulling ourselves. I think it will be a fewer, smaller set. And you know the entrepreneurs that do break out and build large companies, I think will be very, very large. Because Indian companies in this sector, I think, do have the potential to go global as well. Got it. I'm just going to continue, uh, pull a little deeper on that thread with uh, you. Is, um, is government policy a go, no go? decision for you right as you are sitting in the ic meetings right are you thinking you know is is that you know like an overwhelming thing that influences decision or are you like you know it will be figured out eventually we can't really go wrong on this something as critical as you know uh, an ev investment or in general is government policy outside of ev as well is that something that affects the way you invest yes so i think any investor who tells you otherwise you know is, is, uh, is wrong um, regulation in India is core to our economy. Whether you think of fintech, whether you think of EVs, gaming. whether you think of e-commerce, whether you think of gaming, every single industry in India is regulated. Whether there is a regulation or not, it's regulated. And the regulation will always be grey. And you never know whether you're on which side of the line on whether it's grey or you know, whatever it is, right? So there's no real answer on uh, how do we factor this in. Uh, the one thing you can do as an investor and certainly as an entrepreneur as well is have regulatory thinking built into the company from day one. So, for example, in certain industries, it's much easier for us to work with entrepreneurs who have experienced regulation before they start the company. Maybe they experienced it in the previous company that they built. Maybe they were at a large bank. Maybe they were at a you know large manufacturing company. But they have firsthand understood how to navigate and understand regulation. Uh, it may not be needed in the next social media app, but trust me, once that social media app be becomes large enough, you will absolutely need it. So uh, build that muscle in early. Um, don't externalize. The government is part of our life, so it is what it is. Got it. Super. Uh, Amitabh, uh, so I'm going to, I mean, as you think about I mean, increased EV adoption, right? Uh, a core part of that is going to come from financing. Uh, you guys are investors in Oto, but I think there has to be a more fundamental ground-up financing that needs to happen, right? Uh, 
how are you thinking about it how are you seeing uh, how would you like that sector to pan out i think that's the uh, easiest in your segment right which is commercial three wheeler yeah so no it's 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 weird this is an industry there um, that uh, you know india manufactures about 1.3 million three wheelers every year so um and um it's been happening for a for a while so um demand side no issue the strange part is that uh, most of the manufacturers had to build their own financing arms if you think about it you know bajaj finance and mahindra finance and all that it's largely because for whatever reason three wheeler industry was not considered to be one of those industries which you know any Uh, NBFC or commercial bank really wanted to, uh, you know, venture out and invest for whatever reason. It's largely been an ad hoc kind of investment that used to happen either through the dealer or through agents uh, who would help you in the process. Uh, interest rates were as high as 32 percent, 30 to 32 percent. This is for a person who is buying a vehicle for his livelihood. 1.3 million every year are manufactured in this country. that's the status right now come evs um it's it's been very very difficult um we are of course not just um, you know selling three wheelers we're also kind of evangelists for the three wheeler auto rickshaw driver uh, to a certain extent and that shows in the corporate identity and the dealerships that we've created and all that but at the end of the day um, you know we we're trying to see how we can Uh, make sure that first of all financing is available in better terms uh, you know if it's that same civil score that is going to be tracked uh, and poor guy he bought a gas cylinder or you know what a gas stove and he missed out on one of the payments to civil score ki lag gayi so i mean dude can't even buy a, a, a three wheeler from that perspective so we are trying to make sure that we work with financiers um, it's not been easy but we have 19 of them on board now including the likes of sundaram finance and shriram um, you know uh, finance uh, and that has all happened because of data so evs the advantage of evs is each component not just the entire vehicle with gps data but each component is spitting out data. and that data can be used to determine not just how much the vehicle is driving or where the vehicle is and and then the innovation that we have even if you turn off the vehicle you can identify where it is it gives us a sense to the um, to the uh, to the financier and that's the reason why some of these people are now stepping forward it's not just the new age fintech companies um, that are doing this but also the traditional guys because you know this is the first time they are able to see ki as a gaadi hai kahan once you make an investment in diesel how how do you know where the vehicle is most of these guys never show up in a dealership to get their vehicles uh, you know uh, serviced either right it's all roadside so there's a big change that's happening um the way we had to address it by was by going by seeding it few financiers uh, seed a few vehicles they get used to it they like the fact that they can see data they don't like to repo vehicles but they can actually go to the driver and say ki yaar kam chalaya hai what's problem can we figure out something for you and all that so that's worked out we've been able to bring the interest rates all the way up to um, you know 18% which is really good um, our hope is that um, through the convincing that we are doing hopefully commercial banks will start showing up that's when the interest rate really comes down the sad part is in the b2b side you know when there are firms buying auto rickshaws whether cargo or passenger then you get loans at 8 9 10% 10%, even today and the poor guy who's buying it for his livelihood he's getting it at 28% matlab Yeah, so that's that's where we are. Listen, I'm hoping that um, you know more and more uh, people get uh, access to this data, get used to it, and that's why. When PIM two was announced and uh, an implementation began, why government did not nudge RBI to make it a priority sector? 
we have seen that in renewable energy 10 years ago 12 years ago we are seeing all these gigawatt of installation it was actually one 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 important thing that happened in 2014 when rbi classified renewable energy as a priority lending sector right and that's the reason banks started opening up the wallets to various industrial groups to begin with also there were uh, various individual entrepreneurs who set up solar or wind farms and so on and so forth so that 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 lack of coherence yeah, or a consistent thinking is what i think we should all be worried about got yeah. it that's, that's, that's it makes sense. sense and i'll i'll just continue uh, on that so one of the policy uh, issues that affect you is discoms right so uh, i mean i know certain states have uh, maybe uh, delhi or you know uh, but how are you thinking through as you expand your charging network discom policy having to work with so many disparate uh entities and you know coordinating with them about areas that they don't fully understand is that how are you thinking through that and how is it affecting your role out now fortunately before we started charzu we were building up uh, you know renewable energy plants and dealing with regulators was part and parcel of our business then and even today and uh, we actually fought uh, some of the cases we won some we lost not that we want to fight it is because the electricity sector power sector is dominated by state regulators electricity is not the subject of the center electricity is a subject of every state in this country so that's that's a starting point the second part is we realized that we got to deal with discom and stuff and every day we have to deal with them actually i'm also a, cer- a, a certified electrical contractor that's the only time i i found my degree in electrical engineering useful rather yeah um but uh, but when we started of setting up charging station it was very clear that uh, that there will be there will be um, upstream integration that we'll have to do we'll have to set up uh, power infra for every charging station and we walked into this with a very open mind and in 2019 we started off today with 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 uh, 20000 kilometers of highway electrified we are in bangalore right now and uh, bangalore is the city with largest presence that we have for more than 100 plus supercharging stations uh nine hubs that we built in chandapura in um, yalanka and all and they're all done ground up greenfield projects having said that yes discom is a major major challenge because they are all led by government owned entities very few cities in india have private discom that is one part the second part is what we need from discom is only the agility or the speed so just another example we are setting one hyundai charging station here you know close by and bescom server went down just one week ago and for last one week entire bangalore's applications for new electricity connections are not happening after a lot of nudging i said we server ke pehle to manually karte the na hum log to kar lijiye so after a lot of lot of discussion finally the chief electrical engineer nudged saying that okay chalo manually kar lo right and so i'm what i'm saying this is one example there are numerous such examples of discoms in the country but at the end of the day i think uh, one thing is clear that we have a significant uh, uh, a large grid in the country yeah people do ask ki bijli ka mai the first question i was asked by one of, one of our early stage investor that india does not have electricity i said no no there is a there is a there is a correction to be done india is electrified yeah is that we are not able to distribute it well because generation far exceeds distribution in this country and uh, and and what we need to bring is more agility and efficiency into the into the system actually question for both of you um, is there a likelihood that discoms will be privatized in the next uh, government yeah so good question rajinder in fact uh, we <laughs> one of my before chaozon i was actually planning to get into a discom business yeah. and uh, and government or some of the states state government in india have started discom franchises so one of the last discom that has got privatized is one in bhubaneswar in odisha yeah, where tata power is taken over and uh, and uh, as that, so so this particular question also reminds me of famous statement by prime minister modi ji when he was the chief minister of gujarat that the business of government is not to be in business and that's the, and and power sector requires a huge overhaul like one nation one tax same thing we need one nation one grid kind of thing and uh, and at the same time if not all but if let's say top 50 cities in india have private discoms i think life will be a lot better 
I mean, I'll only add very briefly to that. I think it will take a long time. Um, there, there is going to be some coexistence in Bombay and Delhi. We do see uh, private escorts uh, operating, but uh, given the whole legacy and structure of uh, our state-level escorts and everything, it is going to definitely take time. So it's not uh, an immediate bet by any means. Uh, so yeah. Super. Uh, so Chaitanya, uh, I think uh, I think we briefly spoke about this. Uh, you know, EV policy is I think today largely driven as a carrot, uh, you know, based policy, right? And uh, the question was, I mean, should it be driven more by stick as well, right? And so, how much can be mandated? How much can be enforced? Is that practically possible? Before I come to that, because whenever we talk about regulation, hackers are raised that uh, is the ecosystem ready. Um, you can't uh, regulate and mandate things without ensuring that the enablers are in place uh, because then you're just setting up the private sector to fail or whoever is participating to fail. So just before I come to the regulation question, uh, again, uh, what uh, Kathike said about electricity power being a state subject, most of the components under that uh, comprise the EV ecosystem are state subjects. Urban transport is a state subject. Electricity is a state subject. Urban development, where you know, you're looking at building bylaws for in, you know, uh, allowing charging points in buildings, that's a state subject. A lot has been, over the past few years, slowly done at the center. States are now uh, taking on the mantle of uh, promoting the EV ecosystem, moving it forward. Um, as an example, actually, if you count all the subsidies for electric vehicles and charging infrastructure that states, all Indian states and union territories are providing, that works out to something like 7,000 crores, um, which they plan to disperse over a five to seven year period maybe. And that is similar to almost in scale to fame. So at the state level, there is a lot being, again, envisioned, allocated, but there is that gap between policy and implementation. Um, and it is a big gap at the state level, state and local levels. And that is where you're seeing this sort of lack of capacity of discoms. Uh, it is where you're seeing lack of capacity of uh, state transit uh, undertakings, although they're now, some of them are getting better at uh, managing electric buses. Um, that's where you're looking at municipal corporations and what they understand to be their role in building out the EV charging ecosystem. They don't think they have much of a role. Um, or when, they, when they're sitting on land which is needed for charging infrastructure, they are wondering whether, uh, why they should give it at a concessional rate because, you know, there's more money to be made. Cities like Bombay, they're like, every square inch of real estate is so expensive, how can we give some away concessionally for charging? It's, a, it's, a, it's an actual problem. But again, I think building that capacity at the state and local levels is going to be critical to actually translate the policies that are being made uh, to create that enabling ecosystem on ground. Because when we're talking about regulation, the kind of regulation that is currently being discussed are maybe mandates on sales or purchases. So recently Delhi, um, very recently just released a aggregator policy where they've said that uh, all companies that are running electric vehicle, uh, like fleets or, uh, for various services, passenger transport services, uh, e-commerce services, any sort of delivery services, they need to have an electrification plan where they have to hit certain targets and electrify their fleet. So that is a purchase mandate uh, where you're uh, asking the operators to actually um, have certain targets and you're mandating that those targets need to be um, enforced. There's also something called a sales mandate. And here maybe, um, Amitabh, you could come in on uh, whether that would be a good thing or not. Uh, there are examples of uh, uh, states like California, countries like China, um, and even the uh, European Union, which have used different sort of instruments to ensure that manufacturers themselves are manufacturing a share of their vehicles as EVs. So you're saying, instead of organically growing the size of your EV manufacturing, if there are certain targets that companies have to meet, then there is some evidence to show that the EV ecosystem will evolve faster. Because rather than a demand-driven approach, this is a supply-driven approach. And when there's a supply-driven approach, costs will come down faster, investments will happen faster. But again, you need to ensure that all the pieces are in place, the supply chains are in place, on-ground infrastructure is in place, before you mandate that to the private sector. So regulations are a way of 
So so far, it's been a very subsidy-driven market where you're trying to stimulate demand by providing subsidies. Now subsidies are not going to last forever. So how does the phase out of subsidies, how can it coincide with the regulatory framework? And again, this needs to come in well in advance because for uh, companies, we've seen the BS4 to BS6 transition. It completely upended the uh, company's plans because it happened within three years. We can't have the same thing repeat for the EV ecosystem as well. So it needs to be a plan out in advance and that means it needs to start, the discussion on it needs to start happening today, even if the targets don't need to be starting to be set today. So it becomes important on that front. Super. Uh, so uh, coming back to Rajinder, right? I think the previous discussion, um, uh, I think Tarun asked Shailesh about investing in hardware, right? And I think the comment was that it, I mean, people would invest if they were large outcomes, right? Uh, as a VC, you are in, you are chasing that large outcome. Uh, I think Ola Electric is a large outcome. If not, I don't know. I don't know your portfolio, but I'm assuming one of the larger ones, right? So clearly, there are opportunities. Um, so, why do you think more people are not investing in hardware? Uh, what needs to change? How are you thinking about that? So. I think hardware overall, like the history of investing in India is very new. So you don't have, I will confess, there isn't necessarily enough talent at every level. Uh, even on the investing side and definitely on the entrepreneurial side as well, there is certainly a gap in terms of talent. Uh, I think Tarun was also saying that at the managerial level, when you think about manufacturing, engineering, there is a lack of talent there as well. So it, as an ecosystem, we are still relatively early. How do we bootstrap and get out of this situation, right? The reality is India's industry is 15% of GDP. China is like 35, 40%. So it's a national priority. The country wants to solve it. All of us are clear that the policy top down is, seems to be that 15% needs to go to 25, 30%. The government's willing to put money to work to make it happen. Uh, there are PLIs, there are subsidies in different sectors. So it's a no-brainer. It has to happen. And therefore, there is an opportunity for investors as well in this story. Now, where will people more likely play? See, there are PLIs in industries like, I don't know, toy manufacturing, etc. Now, is there enough IP in toy manufacturing? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I'm, I'm not going to you know, say something conclusive there. But is there more IP and more... Uh, uh, R&D know-how in automotive uh, uh, automobiles as a sector, absolutely. And if you look at OEM plays on the EV side, even if you look at component plays within the bomb of each of the manufacturers that you know, either Tarun or you know others in the in the ecosystem, everyone's trying to solve for how do you lower bomb and at the same time improve product quality. So there are large markets. Uh, the India market alone may not be large enough for some of these plays. You might have to look at global markets. But are investors looking at this? Absolutely. Is the entrepreneur archetype the same as the archetype that we backed a decade ago? Definitely not. Uh, you see a lot more people who have spent 10, 15 years who have enough grey hair and you know have have some have some scars on their back and feathers in their cap, all of that. So we, we're seeing more. We will likely do more, uh, and government incentives will act as leverage on whatever capital that we put to work, and it will become a VC investable sector overall. Great. Uh, I'm being given like uh, signals to. I just have one question to end with, and for everyone, if we can quickly do that. So we're saying there are gaps on the government side, right? Uh, what does the industry need to do? What is the gap from the industry standpoint? Are we doing enough? Is there enough depth in the industry? Uh, is there enough interest? Are we, you know, proving to be a large outcome as an industry that? you know, there is interest from the government side as well. So quickly, I think, before we take a question. Or yeah, just um, um, a few seconds on this. Uh, so I, I think it's clear to everyone um, across India, across the world, that EVs are here to stay. Uh, technologies might change. Uh, a few things might happen here and there, but they are going to be here. Whatever it can be, whatever can be done to promote that adoption. And I'm not saying just in the form of subsidy. I know that that's going to go away. That's not the point. But something that is consistent, um, you know, across the board, uh, that's what we need from a government policy perspective. EVs are going to be around. I think there's enough and more innovation that's happening. I mean, we're a startup, 11th year. 
32 global patents have been granted to us. So that's fundamental R&D that's been happening in this company for a long time and there are others also who are doing this. So it's not just us. So I'm saying that there's there's a lot of work that's going on in this, uh, in this domain and I think uh, more and more you'll start seeing um, happen, including in batteries and chemicals and all kinds of things. So, so yeah, it's here to stay. Awesome. Karthik. I think the train has left the station. It's clear that e-mobility is here to stay and it will grow. Um, I was meeting Gadkariji recently and I said, before it becomes a national emergency, can this be made a national priority, the adoption of e-mobility? And the stats are very simple. Uh, if 30% of the vehicles are electric, and I'm only talking about four-wheelers and three-wheelers, let's not keep two-wheelers aside, uh, it will save $126 billion recurring every year on, on crude oil imports. That will support our education and healthcare budget of the country for a number of years. So it's pretty, pretty clear that uh, while, while government has done their bit, um, yes, I, I also I must admit one thing that uh, the industry need to step up now. Yeah. Because uh, at the end of the day, government's job is to roll out the, the, the red carpet, the policy. Uh, all I am saying is that there need to be a proper coherence. That's all we need. But yes, I think I think industry need to really step up the game now. In, yeah. uh, in, in because there are tons of, really, really, thousands of consumers, you know, waiting for the right uh, EV product uh, options to be given, uh, financing and so on. And they are really willing to adopt. Super. Rajinder, uh, as it pertains to your funnel actually. So. No, so just I think industry should play within the bounds of regulation. I think there have been lots of companies that have been playing around regulations and uh, it hurts everyone in the industry who's playing within the bounds of regulation. Super. Yeah, um, I think yeah, uh, industry is doing quite a bit already but just one thing is yeah more on the R&D side and that needs to also come from government in terms of a push and the top players are doing that it is there's also a lot of uh, smaller smaller players that are coming up that are mushrooming looking at the ecosystem that's not necessarily going to be a long-term sustainable outlook if, if you see things like the e-rickshaw sector and all um, there's only a few players that are actually doing um, quality products so I think that focus on quality will become very crucial to ensure that that transition happens because quality and cost yeah how can you balance that to ensure that uh, the transition happens for the consumer great thank you so much uh, we'll take a quick audience question or two if there is one yeah i have a quick question just a second uh, thank, thank you very much great discussion uh, i know uh, government also is trying doing its best but thing is there are so many mixed signals also coming in the papers they sometimes talk about ethanol sometimes talk about hydrogen and it's confusing for the customer also like will ev is really going to stay or uh, you know ethanol is going to come or hydrogen is coming i mean uh, toyota is coming with green cars and all that so your uh, point of view on that like what what is going to stick around for the next 5 10 years i don't know I think they would take uh, think, offense yeah. to the. <laughs> no, 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 perfect. No, 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 I'm just. The alternative, uh, the alternate fuels will be here to stay. It's very clear. Yeah. And uh, uh, other than uh, diesel and petrol, I think we have EVs, we have uh, uh, bio, uh, biofuels, uh, ethanol, and, and so on. Yes, uh, I think I think that could be one think tank, and we have um, Chetan here from WRI. Uh, maybe maybe she can lead this entire exercise to give a clarity. Largely to the industry, you know, in general, and the market in general, that uh, what trends were and how. But once, but but at the same time, we as a consumer are pretty much used to this, right? We had CNG, Correct. yeah. And when CNG came, then we say, okay, it will, CNG will take over petrol. It never happened. Yeah. But, but but it's clear that alternative fuel options is now now the now the order of the story. Just to add two points to that. One is I think it will be use case led. Number one, our different use cases are going to see the economics work out for different alternative fuels definitely towards the cleaner fuel ecosystem but uh, which use case will go with which fuel is something that will still uh, determine to be, remain to be seen and secondly uh, where you're seeing quicker uptake therefore is the uh, commercial vehicle space where you know you have faster cycles like they're going to the vehicles are going to be used up in five to seven years and so they know that it's not a long-term bet i think it's more for the private sector like for individuals to transition that clarity will be helpful because we've seen that with diesel only being limited to 10 years and all there's been a massive shift away from diesel uh, income consumers so they don't want that to happen with ev and that might be part of their hesitation so that clarity definitely needs to come um, especially for the consumer individual consumers Well, 
big round of applause for this awesome panel over here. Thank you, <coughs> Amitabh and Kartike, Rajinder. Thank you, Chaitanya and Manu for coming all the way. Really appreciate this. Uh, fantastic. Some of them have actually flown in from outside the city and some of them outside the country as well. So thank. give big round of applause, guys. One more time. Thank you. Thank you.